So I'm a little bit sleep deprived. I hope I can keep it together for the next 30 minutes, but if I start rambling incoherently, just like, clip your fingers. Um, today, I want to use fear and loading to, to inspire you to deploy RPKI origin validation. I'm not gonna lie about my hidden agenda here. I'm going to scare you, I'm going to present you with danger that will not go away, and then I'll show you that the obvious solution to all of this is RPKI and how the industry, uh, what the current industry trends are. Um, so first we must uh, establish a degree of empathy with our uh, perpetrators, the people that deploy BGP optimizers. Then we'll establish what these BGP optimizers do, why they are dangerous, and how we can uh, mitigate some of the risk they represent to our companies and the internet uh, in general. And then finally, we'll uh, go over some highlights from uh, last year and compare uh, what the current status is 12 months later. When we talk about traffic engineering, directionality is crucial. We talk about in and out, but we should be clear on what in and what out is. Uh, in this presentation, when I talk about outbound traffic engineering, I mean traffic you generate and push out to adjacent networks to be delivered. So maybe I'm the web server. What's inbound is the HTTP request towards me. What's out is my answer to that client. And to further narrow it down, we're not going to talk about in, uh, inbound traffic engineering because that's simple. You can use a bit of prepending, you can deaggregate, you can just force things through links uh, of your choosing. Inbound traffic engineering is uh, not a challenge. Outbound traffic engineering uh, is interesting because you originate the packets. This means you have an extreme degree of control, and with such control, what is it that you can do? So this is an example scenario. We have a company, uh, U, in the lower left corner. We have two transit providers and a peering platform or private peering. Actually, the, intermediate, the function of the intermediate networks themselves is uh, not that relevant. Uh, and through these intermediate networks, the rest of the internet is reached, including uh, Zigo, which will be one of the victims in our examples. So, in the Netherlands, we, are, we should be really grateful. There are thousands of shops where you can buy IP transit. There's many internet exchanges. There's many high quality data centers. Dark fiber is extremely affordable. We are lucky. Except for IPv6 deployments. But. In other places in this world, people are less fortunate. They may be faced with uh, virtually no diversity in terms of upstream or connectivity providers. It may be the case that the incumbent carrier in a specific market doesn't really have significant capacity and that there are, within a limited choice of vendors, additional constraints such as limited amount of bandwidth, not all organizations have full-time uh, uh, network engineers. Uh, the majority, like for NTTs, it's easy. We, we, our core business is we sell internet access, so we better have some internet engineers. But many companies that have a presence on the internet have their presence, their autonomous system number, their uh, prefix space, uh, not because their core product is internet, but because they wanted a degree of autonomy or independence. Um, what I'm saying is, it's a wild world out there, and what we face here in the Netherlands is, is not what other people on this planet face. And this may lead to tilted situations, because if you're in a situation where circuits are constrained, prices are high, and you don't really have people that 24-7 uh, staff to, to take care of things, if you run into a sales uh, a person that promises they will improve performance, reduce cost, add intelligence, leverage existing connectivity, and monitor all of this 24-7, you'd be a fool to say, no, I don't want that. So 
what some of the software does, and this is what is appealing in situations where you're facing constraints, is you install a sort of appliance, you configure it to, to probe uh, the available paths towards the rest of the internet. Uh, you can use source-based routing or DHCP markings, or there's a number of tricks. And then based on these probings, uh, a sort of traffic profile is created and pushed into your network that dictates that, for instance, you'll push 40% on transit one, 10% on transit two, and then the rest on the IXP. And the nice thing about software that promises to monitor for performance, uh, that monitors how much traffic you're actually sending, is that if you face financial constraints, such as the price per megabit is really, really high, then you want to seal as close as possible to the commit you uh, have with that specific upstream provider. Um, a common thing in, in IP transit markets is that you need to commit a percentage of the bandwidth of the interface you're uh, buying. Uh, and if you don't use that uh, capacity, you're still paying for it. So software that takes into consideration loss, performance, latency, and your monthly bill sounds awesome. I mean, what I'm saying is the need for this is legitimate. We cannot deny that people may want to use software like this. But once you deploy such an uh, appliance, you sort of become a ticking time bomb, and your adjacent networks should be scared shitless, if they knew. Why is this scenario the way it is? What is the danger? Because we, we kind of operate in a lot of scenarios under the assumption that decisions I make within my network may stay in my network, and it's, it's my network. I can do what I want. Now, it, let's deconstruct how these optimizers work. In the upper right corner, we have Ziggo. One of Ziggo's prefixes is slash 11. And if we simplify, the network design, there is uh, three intermediate paths between you and that slash 11. And a challenge with uh, BGP traffic engineering is that a slash 11 may represent a, a significant amount of, of traffic. Uh, in this instance, I suspect there's many uh, eyeballs in them. And in the way uh, uh, routing is, is implemented on many devices, you, you can easily end up with a scenario where the whole slash 11 is routed either left over transit one or over transit two, but balancing things is quite tough. And then if we keep in mind that maybe performance over time alters, maybe we're behind not optimal circuits, there's the pricing considerations we need to take into consideration. Uh, you could argue there's a bunch of optimizing to do. And I, I appreciate that argument, but what I have trouble with is how that optimization takes place. Um, these BGP optimizers create hijacks, essentially. What it does is it, it looks at your traffic profile, it looks at S-flow uh, or NetFlow data, it, looks, it gets a BGP feed, it sees the paths available, and then it inserts more specifics into your iBGP where the next stop is either transit one or transit two, or, or an IXP pair. So in this example, uh, the slash 11 is the only legitimate prefix length that could exist for this prefix, and Ziggo is the only valid originator of that specific prefix. But internal in our BGP optimized network, we have a slash 12 to force at least half the traffic over transit one, a slash 12 that is pointed to a pair, and a slash 14 over our tiny circuit that is transit two. Now this is all still seemingly innocent, uh, but not quite, because when those leaks escape the domain they were supposed to stay within, all hell breaks loose for everybody. Not just the company that deployed the BGP optimizer, but also Ziggo and perhaps intermediate networks. Because the, why this is absolute poison is the moment your fake slash 12 escapes your 
uh, administrative domain, your autonomous system, maybe because uh, you made a typo in a policy, maybe there's a bug in your BGP implementation, maybe uh, you didn't apply no export at the correct location. There's a whole bunch of reasons, some of which we do control, and some of which we have no control over. And specifically, the case where you run into bugs in BGP implementations, what are you gonna do? So your slash 12 escapes and you announce it to transit one. And for whatever reason, transit one accepts this prefix and propagates it to the rest of the internet. Then at that moment, transit two and the peers at the IXP and basically the whole internet start sending traffic towards transit one, towards you. But in your domain, that slash 12 has this next hop, the uh, LinkNet IP address of transit one. So you're advertising to transit uh, one. Via me, you can reach this slash 12. Meanwhile, any packets that you receive over the circuit, which is probably congested to the brink, uh, those packets are sent back to transit one. And then transit one's router will be like, well, that's cool, but that slash 12 is on your side. So you have a loop on the data plane because the control plane is pointing towards a route that never existed in the first place. Because that slash 12 is an entire fabrication. It's a lie, it's a hijack. It should not exist, and it should not exist on the global internet. And as long as these lies stay within the domain uh, of, of the deployer of the BHP optimizer, things are fairly well. But you cannot guarantee that those route announcements stay within your domain. And every few months, we see large-scale routing incidents, and a lot of the time, it's one particular company that turns out to be involved. We are always involved. <laughs> um, so this is really, really tricky. In a way, this reminds me of uh, the environment, or, or natural environment. If you look at, for instance, uh, water, uh, the Rhine, it starts somewhere where they talk weird German, and then it goes for normal German, and then it takes, and, and it crosses multiple countries. And if in one of those countries, there is a factory that needs to get rid of some chemical waste, they may be like, well, it's really close to the river, and the river is going that direction, so, and it solves their immediate problem. Now, the downside of that approach is the closer that factory is to the source of this river, the more people are adversely affected. And it can be challenging to explain to these factories, please don't dump your waste in, in the river. And they'll be like, well, but it's really cheap and it's efficient and it's high performance. And, and you'll be like, but it, it harms me. And they'll be like, but are you paying for better waste disposal? I mean, we can attribute blame, but what do we do about the cost of these uh, involved entities? But I, I, I think this is, this is a fairly good analogy. The eBHP environment, the default free zone, should be considered a shared resource that all of us have a stake in. And the moment we connect, uh, we have both the privilege and the ability to multi-home and communicate with the rest of the internet. That's the beautiful part. The downside is that we can also negatively impact the rest of the internet. Now, why do these things happen in the first place? Why do things leak out? Um, as it happens, not all BGP optimizers take the most basic of precautions. Some of them do not add the no expert well-known BGP community to, route, to those fake uh, uh, route announcements. This is unfortunate, because I, I like default by secure. It's not happening here. Uh, BHP implementations have bugs. Uh, this happens from time to time, and if that coincidences with the presence of a BHP optimizers, and maybe your peers or upstream's filters are relaxeder than they should be, uh, it's a recipe for disaster. Another reason why this is happening is that, to be honest, in BGP's protocol specification, as it stands today, what is available to us through Cisco, Nokia, Juniper, etc., 
There is no such thing as a traffic engineering address family. When I create a more specific route, it is a route that is in the same address family as the internet routes. Uh, and what some of these BGP optimizers do by setting up an IBHP session and then setting the next stop of the upstreams or peers uh, relevant for the traffic delivery, they are reusing components that exist in every BGP implementation. Procade uh, can be made to work with these things as well. So from the BGP optimizer's perspective, it is very interesting to be able to address as broad of a market as possible. Uh, but from us as an operator perspective, it's kind of shitty that we are doing traffic engineering in the same address family as normal reachability. Um, and if, if we look at anti-competitive markets, with that I mean markets where you have maybe no choice or very limited choice uh, uh, of upstream providers, whenever people are faced with constraints, they will be creative. That's what we do if we, we don't take no for granted. So again, it's really hard to, to firmly blame the people deploying this software because they may have very legitimate needs uh, that cannot be addressed through other means. And then finally, I think uh, BHP optimizers are used uh, in a similar way that, that some insurance companies manage to uh, uh, trick you into a false sense of security. What the software does in part is it presents beautiful dashboards with, with green and traffic lights and graphs and they, every day you can see 43% was optimized today. Nobody knows what that 43 is. Like packets, bits per second, movements, who knows? But it's a number and it looks great. And we humans like that. <laughs> hey, well, what's more appealing, dashboard or black and white CLI? So, Considering these things, BHP optimizers uh, uh, may be depopularized. We may think twice before we deploy them, but I cannot envision them going away in the near future uh, because of these circumstances and the lack of uh, proper tooling in the BHP protocol itself to solve this in a less dangerous way. And to zoom in on the use of no export, um, there is this one company that, that has software that by default will generate and insert these fake routes into your uh, domain. And by default, it does not tag these routes with the no export community. And the problem here is that without the well-known no export community, you remove any chance of stopping these things from leaking out to the wider internet. If that community is attached, Perhaps, maybe out of the box, in a lot of scenarios, things go okay enough to not make news headlines. But the moment you're not engaging uh, uh, with the operational community and listening to, to what I would say is, is, is firm advice and, and say, well, for like a small percentage of our customers, no export gets in the way of what they want to do. So by default on every installation uh, now in the past and in the future, we do not use uh, this precaution. And that's, that's really unfortunate. Um, yeah, this is how you make headlines. So what can you do against uh, this danger? Because by now all of you should be like, damn it, we're in trouble. Luckily there is a solution, RPKI. It has two aspects. You need to help other people protect your business interests. And the moment you create RPKI ROAS for your prefixes, you facilitate that the other 69,000 something something autonomous system numbers on the internet uh, at least had the opportunity to make an informed decision whether they should accept a given BGP announcement or not. So be selfish, create RPKI ROAS. Then the second thing you can do, and this is again to protect yourself, but also protects other people, is to deploy origin validation. Use that RPKI ROA information, use it to drive your routing decisions, and that way your network will benefit most, but others will benefit too. So RPKI, it's all about uh, uh, you know, deploying it can be done for selfish reasons, and that's fine. In all of this, make sure that you set the max length attribute of your RPKI ROAS correctly. 
if you set them up to say slash 24 or, or further, uh, you risk falling victim of the BGP optimizers. Because not only are these BGP optimizers uh, forging uh, uh, the prefix length, uh, but they happily fabricate an AS path and often they will copy the actual origin into their uh, fabricated AS path, uh, which makes things look nice in looking glasses. You're like, oh, that's not suspect. Yeah, that's Ziggo space and that's Ziggo ASN, that's, that's cool. But in reality, that ASN had nothing to do with the announcement and all of it was a lie, including the AS path. Uh, so max length is of crucial importance here. Set it as short as possible. Another hint uh, or pro tip, uh, aside from deploying origin validation, an effective strategy to deal with uh, some of the risks that uh, people deploying BGP optimizers may uh, present to you uh, can be mitigated in part by peering directly with each other. The moment you set the local preference of your peering partners and your upstreams to the same, I don't know, 100, uh, this means you, you'll create an opportunity for the AS path length to be the tiebreaker when it comes to making uh, uh, choices. If you combine that with origin validation, you have a fairly robust situation and it's fairly cheap to do. You set up direct peering, you set up origin validation, and the result of that is that you have AS path validation, but just for one hop. And this behavior of peering directly with each other coincidences usually with business interests. For instance, if I'm sending some traffic to you and we both enjoy exchanging the traffic, why would we not cut out the middleman and set up direct peering between the two of us? So peering directly for, for decades has been uh, mostly financially driven. Uh, but nowadays, aside from the economic benefits, I think there are tangible security benefits as well if you combine direct peering with origin validation. All right, second part of my presentation uh, is uh, industry trends. The Air Intel, I don't really have news. The relaying party agreement is still the same as it was last year. It is my understanding that Aaron's board of trustees is uh, performing a study uh, on how to move forward and if changes are warranted. Uh, but we're still waiting for, the, uh, uh, for, for news from that. Um, other news, I mean, let's talk a little bit about PMACCT. Paolo, you're in the room, good. Beautiful software, complex software, and it's hard to summarize in one slide. And then I realized, what if I take a screenshot of a previous presentation, and that will summarize all of it. What PMACCT does for you, in a nutshell, it is a traffic analysis engine. It ingests your BGP feeds, S-flow data, NetFlow data. It can correlate this with uh, magic, and then dump it into a database or a message bus, and this can help you uh, drive your business intelligence. And with that, I mean, uh, it can help you figure out how to make your network more profitable. And we added a feature to this uh, to understand what the economic impact would be of deploying RPKI origin validation in NTT's network. Uh, and thanks to PMST, we are now uh, very certain that an incredibly small amount of traffic uh, would be lost if we deploy origin validation and invalid is reject policies. So that's very nice, very reassuring, and this uh, makes discussions with higher ups easier. Uh, for more information about this concept, click the link on the bottom of this slide. When we created this, we kind of poked fun at a uh, sort of competitor, uh, Kentic, uh, instead of describing what they do, I figure, let's use another screenshot. Uh, this describes it all. They produce uh, beautiful graphs in the cloud and uh, pleasing dashboards, which are soothing. And Kentec knows where to find the really good ideas. And they are public about that, which is much appreciated. Um, the cool thing now is that there is not just one, but there are two mature solutions in the market to figure out whether origin validation will have adverse uh, impact on the economics of your network. Every network I've spoken to so far that deployed origin validation confirms that 
it's basically without incidents, without revenue loss, and with virtually no customer complaints. If you have the need to validate this yourself, you can use either PM Act or Cantic uh, to get more insight into that aspect of origin validation. Uh, other cool news. Last year, I talked about uh, plans uh, to, to refresh uh, IRD, the engine that drives most of the internet's prefix filter genera generation. Uh, back then, it was a little bit better than a pipe dream, uh, but now we have deployed this brand new, from scratch, uh, IRD on our production surfaces and are very happy with it. And why this is significant um, is because this rewrite uh, that is a drop-in replacement of what we had but was a 20-year-old code base will allow us to innovate and do cool new things. The previous code base it was an organically grown uh, first-year student uh, hobby project that, that was very, very hard to extend. You change one thing here, everything over there uh, falls apart. Um, and once we realized that the code was actually no longer maintainable, uh, we, yeah, we ended up deciding we need something new. So please take a look. Uh, if you generate filters yourself, consider installing a local copy to make your uh, filter generation speedier. Now, the plan I proposed last year is to use RPKI data to clean up IRR data. Because with RPKI, we have strong assurances that the resource holder was the one creating the ROA. Whereas with IRR, who knows who created the route object? Could be anybody. And there is no crypto to validate anything. They, these things, they exist. They may be, and hopefully, they help us achieve what we want. But sometimes, they can negatively, at first, uh, uh, impact our routing security. Uh, because maybe they make filters too relaxed. So the proposal was uh, to use the IRD instances as a smart middleware between the IR data sources that are not trustworthy and the consumers of such data, such as BGP Q3 or PEVEL or uh, homegrown filter generators. If we put RPKI-based filtering in the middle of that, we don't need to upgrade the clients. We don't need to change BGP Q3. In fact, we can leave the entire ecosystem as it is. We only need to upgrade that one component in the middle. Uh, so we're now uh, working towards uh, finalizing the details on this, and I hope to have more news for you in the next few months. To make sure we were betting on multiple horses, uh, I are solving the, the problem of unreliable IRR information in the IRD instance itself is one approach. Another approach is to do it at the RER level. In the case of uh, RIPE, we have the RIPE non-affordative database. The RIPE non-affordative database exists for historical reasons. It's very hard to figure out who created what, when, and why, and if it's still needed. But what we can figure out is that if objects in that data source are in conflict with published RPKI information, the object describes a state that cannot exist, a combination of a prefix and an origin ASN that are forbidden by the existence of a covering ROA. Uh, within the RIPE community, we have a, a, a policy proposal to, to instruct RIPE NCC to apply a cleanup mechanism based on RPKI on that non affordative data uh, set. And it is my hope that this will be ratified uh, at some point. So far, there seems to be some support. Uh, the current phase of this PDP uh, uh, thing will end September 12th. So if you want to speak up, come to the routing working group and voice your thoughts. Let's switch gears for a second. Unfortunately, we've seen this happen way too often. You have a really cool company that has a really cool product that is really useful to your particular use case, and then it's bought by a bigger company, and the bigger company is like, well, remember that thing you really liked? It's end of life. Bye. And this happened uh, to BGP Mon, um, which, has, which posed this whole industry with, with a challenge, because I don't think any of us were 
really expecting BGP Mon to, to disappear. I mean, it's been there for close to 10 years. It's like an old friend we've come to rely on. Um, so that was a bit of an unfortunate situation. Uh, luckily, uh, Massimo, where are you? You should wave at him. The more you wave, the bigger his smile. <laughs> yeah, it worked. Uh, we needed a replacement. Uh, we, at NTT, we, we depend on BHP Mon. Uh, we have uh, a set of prefixes that are of, of paramount importance uh, to, to our business. Uh, that's specifically our own prefixes and uh, of certain uh, daughter companies. And we use uh, this monitoring software to become aware of hijacks or, or leaks or, or whatnot. Uh, because maybe a hijack is not propagating into entity's backbone, but it may be visible on the rest of the internet. And that's really good to know when you're putting together an RFO or trying to take action to resolve the issue at hand. So as a successor, we have BGP Alerter. What BGP Alerter does is it's this, uh, think of it as an engine. Uh, it consumes data uh, through connectors. At this moment in time, uh, the ripe RIS Live API, it's a streaming API, is the only data source, but the software has already taken into account that perhaps route views, perhaps the NLNOC looking glass, perhaps other sources of data can feed into this engine. Uh, it should be source agnostic. Then this data is pulled through what are called monitors. These are uh, data processing elements that figure out an, an evaluation. Uh, is an event happening or is this steady state? And if something is happening, it kicks off a subsequent part of this process uh, that we call reports. And reports are the channels out of this uh, uh, analyzer engine. And those are what you pipe to, say, email or telegram or whatnot. And this way, you can monitor for hijacks when more specifics appear that should not exist or exist without your authorization. Or another interesting thing, uh, visibility issues. If one of your prefixes suddenly no longer is visible anywhere, it may mean that you shut down the wrong router. So both aspects are important. You want to know when they are in the DFC. You want to know when they're not in the DFC. You want to know if a BHP optimizer is having a go at them. Uh, and BHP Alerter will help in this context. Uh, it's free, freely available to, to everyone, a BSD license. Uh, we, we've wrote it with performance in mind. And we kind of hope that you will contribute ideas, codes, documentation, pretty pictures. You know, let's make it a community project. Uh, here's a quick demonstration. You start the program. The program was configured to monitor a specific set of prefixes. So it subscribes to the uh, API. It tells the API, if you see anything related to these prefixes, tell me. And, and don't tell me about the rest. If something happens, if right, right, uh, if right rest life uh, uh, spots a BHP event that matches the criteria of your subscription, it sends it to BHP alerter. BHP Alerter can then uh, run it through the monitor, and then we can discover if something is, if there is an event or not. And in this case, uh, Rinse Kluk contributed an example where he was monitoring his uh, aggregates, and when he started the software, he noticed uh, a prefix that he was pulling through a DDoS mitigator, uh, and that indeed was a more specific that was not explicitly documented or allow listed in his config. Uh, so this, this is, uh, basically what you can do with it. Or you can pipe it into emails, which I like, or you pipe it into Slack, which other people like, and I bet you somebody can hook this up to AOL or MSN. The sky is the limit. Another thing we should cover briefly, um, if you are an internet exchange, or if you're connected to an internet exchange, you should be aware that there is virtually no argument for internet exchanges to not do origin validation. If we look at the available software, there's RPKI support in a route server, there's RPKI support in IXP manager. Both are tools that are used uh, either separately or in conjunction to orchestrate operations around internet exchanges. Then you have RPKI support in BERT, a popular route server implementation, as well as in OpenBHPD. And for the majority of internet exchanges, this is more than enough 
to do origin validation. And if we keep in mind that concept of peering directly with each other combined with origin validation, uh, it is logical, it is, I would say, required that every route server on this planet does origin validation. So if you are not an internet exchange, but you are connected to one, please write your representatives and indicate that you would be interested in the internet exchange supporting this feature. A lot of companies have no uh, uh, ill intent, but are driven by customer feedback. And sometimes, you know, a lot of people just have to ask, please do this. And then they're like, okay. So that's your to-do item for today. Write your connectivity suppliers, ask them for origin validation, especially if they're internet exchanges. And this brings me to the end of my updates. Um, with this, I would like to open up the floor for comments, suggestions, ideas, remarks. If you don't feel comfortable coming to the microphone right now, I am more than happy to answer things through email or Twitter DMs. Uh, so please reach out now or later. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so I just had a question regarding, do you know of any authoritative, uh, I guess, aggregators of IRR data? As in one that only maybe does uh, the RPI based uh, entries and also from like the ripe uh, of for the data source and APNIC and AFRNIC, again, just the ones that actually require authentication. So we could just ignore the like alt DB, rad B, et cetera. That, that is a, a, a good remark. I did not cover it in this presentation. Uh, I did cover some of that a little bit in uh, last year's updates. If you go to this URL, you can rewatch it. Uh, what I didn't separate out in this presentation is that there's all kinds of IR sources. The IR is a wild variety of things. You have the right database, which is strictly checked against uh, uh, the wishes of the resource holder. The right non authoritative database, which was not checked ever. Uh, and this is just one organization. It has a perfectly valid source of data and a source of data that is potentially tainted. Uh, NTTCOM is a database without verification. To add verification of any sort, uh, for instance, to prevent uh, the, the most basic of, of checks, uh, like uh, duplication checks, uh, we needed that new IRD. So now that the new IRD is in place, we can, for the first time, we're, we're close to software that can help uh, make IR a little bit more reliable. Uh, there's the APNIC database. It only contains routing data that was uh, authorized by the resource holder. Um, out of all the IR databases, it's, it's a mixed bag. And my hope is that with the next uh, iteration of IRD, you can specify, put an RPKI condom on these data sources, and these data sources I trust. And what you synthesize out of the combination of that, that is what you use to deploy in your routers. Okay, thank you. And I also want to thank Sasha as well for such a great job uh, on writing IRD4. Absolutely. They did a phenomenal job. Right? I realized how bad I am as a programmer after reading <laughs> their code. Um, you were first. Yes, uh, Paul de Weert, RIPE NCC. Um, I don't so much have a question for you, Job, as well as much for the uh, audience. Uh, it's about the, uh, uh, the RIS uh, data that you uh, mentioned. Uh, if you don't peer with an RC yet, please do so. This will increase the uh, quality of the data. Uh, but also, because most people in, uh, uh, in Western Europe do peer with RCs, if you have contacts with uh, other networks, please ask them to peer with RCs also. That will basically improve the, uh, uh, the whole system. I wholeheartedly Thanks. agree. We have to realize that in attempting to keep an eye on what the rest of the internet is doing with our prefixes, we kind of rely on the rest of the internet sharing their views on the BHP tables with a clearinghouse such as RIPE NCC or Packet Clearinghouse or Route Views or, or uh, Isolario or the NLNOC Looking Glass. All these tools are what basically helps keep all of us honest. So 
if you contribute your view, and we hope other people contribute their view as well, uh, the totality of that makes for good monitoring solutions. So yeah, peer with route collectors, always. So you used <coughs> uh, Zigo, the big cable ISP here in Holland, uh, with the slash 11 as, uh, as an example that the root optimizer is going to, to target and split up the slash 11 to smaller prefixes. Um, is that something that, that is an unusual situation because you have such a large pre prefix with such a large number of, of traffic uh, sinks behind it? Uh, or is this something that they also do for really small prefixes? Uh, my experience so far seems to suggest that there is a bit of a feedback loop between the, uh, the flow data. So if we look at the ticking time bomb, we, we can assume that the, the routers in that network are sending some flow data to the BGP optimizer. And for the BGP optimizer, if you're constrained to specific commits per link, it of course makes sense to first split up the prefixes that you're sending, that you're actually sending traffic to, and then uh, uh, optimize prefixes that are of less interest. Because if you, if you have to balance between, say, uh, uh, a 10 gig and a 1 gig, then, and you want to swing traffic either left or right, then targeting high uh, traffic prefixes will bring you most bang for buck. So, perversely, the, the, the networks that are most vulnerable to the pollution of BGP optimizers, usually are also networks that serve entire countries. And in a way, this is, this is how you take countries offline. We, this has happened before multiple times, and it's, it's very unfortunate uh, that the large prefixes also coincidentally serve large populations and then have a higher risk of being victims. So again, make RPK ROAs. I, at this moment in time, there is nothing else I can recommend you. Well, obviously everything that you said is true and, and, and should, everybody should, should do that. But what I was wondering is, so, so suppose that instead of one big prefix, they announce 10, just for simplicity. Now you can just send, uh, use five prefixes in that direction, four that and, and, and one that, so the optimizer wouldn't have to split it. So could that be a solution for these really large prefixes to just say, well, obviously we don't, we don't want to go down to slash 24, but maybe slash 11 for a half a country is, is maybe a bit too much if we split that into a dozen prefixes or so that makes everybody's life happy, uh, easier for traffic engineering. That's uh, a very insightful uh, uh, comment. Uh, and I have observed this. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to comment on that as well. Uh, we've been Can having first? a lot of, yeah. A lot of slash 24s, which been split into 25s, 26s, 27s, even 29s by these optimizers. So in that case, it was a lot of, uh, I think it was Ubuntu FTP machines that were sharing the same slash 24. And we see on BGP Mon that we could see that the optimizers first tried it with 25s. But that was obviously not successful, right, because they don't propagate well. And then it just continued on with 26, 27, 28. So it's, will never work by fighting, be, by the aggregation. These try, will try to do it anyway. It, it, it's, it's sort of a race to the bottom. Because this slash 11, if we split it up, we have two slash 12s. But then somebody somewhere will have eight upstream providers and have a commit of 12 megabit with each of those. And he wants to perfectly balance. And he'll, they'll say uh, two slash 12s is not granular enough. We need more. And, we can never please anybody. So I, I've seen this in practice. Uh, Deutsche Telekom for a while uh, uh, split up a slash 10 and they also announced a slash 11 because they recognized some other people may have traffic engineering uh, uh, issues. But it's, de-aggregation is, is rarely a, a good solution. And if these people start de-aggregating up to slash 24 to counter hijacks, then uh, we'll be growing our routing tables at a faster pace than we can afford to. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, and of course, if you are already on slash 24 or something really small, then it doesn't make sense. But uh, slash 11, that's 2 million, uh, 2 million uh, addresses. And each of those could be a quarter gi uh, gigabit worth of downstream capacity. So that's, that's petabits 
Well, obviously, you can, there's no way to handle that properly uh, as, as one big thing if you want to do uh, traffic engineering. So we don't want to go any, anywhere near slash 24, but maybe a bit smaller than slash, 20, uh, slash 11 might be part of the solution. Uh, also keep in mind that uh, maybe I'm sending a lot of traffic to if we view this as a spectrum from zero to 200, uh, maybe I'm sending a lot of traffic to this portion, but you are sending a lot of traffic to that portion. And both our optimizers will try to act in our interest and you have to de-aggregate for all those scenarios. And I, what I'm saying is I don't think de-aggregation will, will scale uh, to the level we need it to scale in this context.